question I get asked an absolute bucket load by amateur athletes, and it's something that I struggle with at times as well, is why can't I run slow enough or why can't I keep my heart rate down when I'm trying to do a zone two run? Getting those base Ks in is absolutely vital to endurance performance and improving your endurance performance. We know it's super critical for building up the distance in your training, building some chronic training load. There's so many benefits to it, but we're not maximizing that if we can't keep the intensity at the appropriate level. If we're working too hard, it all just blends into one and we know how that goes. We've spoken about on the channel here before. So in this video, I'm gonna be covering it off from more of a physiological perspective, touch on a little bit of the biomechanics and the running technique side of things that influence uh, things like our running economy and why that's causing that heart rate to drift. And then a few little things that you can do and start to look at and point you in the right direction of how you can start to improve some of these factors. And, and I might throw in a few of my uh, sort of personal examples in there as well. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Welcome back to the channel, Nick here, making sports science simple. And in this video, it is one of, as I said in the introduction, it's one of the most asked things I get from amateur athletes when it comes to running, whether it's triathletes, runners, ultra runners, long course, short course, whatever it is, is when I go out and do my zone two runs, I either one, can't keep my heart rate down low enough, um, or two, I can't run slow enough to be able to sustain the actual effort. And, and this is a frustration that I share with a lot of these people who ask it as well is because um, I don't do a lot of that long slow. I commonly do some intermittent high intensity stuff with, with the, the sport and the, the umpiring that I do. When it comes to building up long slow Ks, I'm trying to go through a bit of that process now into my off season for football. So I might do a bit of triathlon if I can over summer, try and build that. Up. My heart rate today, I went for a run. I had to call the run early because my heart rate shot up to 175, 180, and I just couldn't get it down to save myself. I'm running at like five minute, 5.30 pace, which for me is relatively slow. So it's the type of thing that it can become quite frustrating. And ultimately, it's going to ruin that bang for buck nature of what, uh, what we're trying to get out of those training sessions, and particularly when they're taking up the biggest amount of your week in terms of training time. Super, super critical that we work out ways that we can get that heart rate down to the correct zone based on our physiology, based on our testing data from the lab, to make sure that we're getting the most out of those sessions every time we go out and do those long runs. So the first thing we need to talk about is really the concept of economy, because this is where it all stems from. If you go out and you run, it's not as simple as, um, and you could think about this really as like being on your, your indoor trainer if you're a cyclist or a triathlete, and I got my bike set up behind me, but um, you can think about it like that is that if I jump on there and there's no aerodynamics present, so there's no wind rushing past me, I'm in a stationary position, it really is a case of if I had an estimate of speed uh, based on my, my power, it's more power equals more speed. I go faster for a greater greater input. From a running perspective, obviously we know that that's a little bit different when you go out on the road. There's aerodynamics, rolling resistance, a whole bunch. But from a running perspective, it's not as simple as if I just run harder and if I create more energy and more power through my, my stride and, and, and try to turn the cadence over, it's not necessarily going to lead to me actually being able to run faster. Um, why? Because we have an oxygen cost of movement, which is effectively our economy, because we can't avoid the technique side of things in running. We, we, have to, we have to produce some form of technique to get us to move. And how good our economy is, is gonna determine what that oxygen cost is. So you can produce as much energy as you like. And we quite often see this in the lab with people who have really, really high VO2 values. So you might have a VO2 max in terms of mils of oxygen uh, per minute, uh, 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 mils per kilo per minute, should I say, relative air to max of 65 or 70, a really great number for an amateur athlete. But you might not be running very fast. You might only be running 345 pace. So what that says to me is the economy is not as fantastic as someone who might only have a VO2 max of 65, not quite as high, or 60. It's still pretty good for an amateur, but they might be running at three minute K pace. So what they're investing, they're investing it as slightly less amount of oxygen as a lower oxygen cost, but they're getting such a, a great advantage. And I guess the cycling version of that is someone who is extraordinarily aerodynamic. You might only put in 200 watts and you're going 38 Ks an hour, but someone else might be doing 240 watts and going the same speed. That's what we're looking at from a running perspective. It's, it's can we minimize our actual internal energy production, oxygen uh, consumption, oxygen cost to create that, that output? Because ultimately if we can do that, there's a couple of key benefits. One, we're not gonna be burning through our fuel as quickly. Less oxygen um, required by the body is gonna mean we're not gonna be burning through our carbs as fast. Um, 
what does that derpa do? It delays the onset of fatigue by things like depleting carbohydrate stores, which is a critical one. What it also does is it's gonna allow us to keep our heart rate down. And the reason for that is our heart rate comes up as a response to the oxygen demand at the working muscle. So what I'm talking about here is when the muscle sense I need oxygen to create aerobic energy and be able to create uh, the movement that we want. If I wanna be able to move my legs, I need to create energy at the muscle that's gonna, I get essentially power that movement. If that increases, so I go out and I start running, it's gonna naturally increase as I start to run. And as I start to run faster, it's gonna increase more and more because I need more energy to create more powerful contractions in the quads, get the body moving a lot faster, etc. As my body senses it needs more oxygen, it's gonna try and supply more. So that's increases in respiratory and ventilation, um, and getting the air in in the first place. But primarily it's gonna be also supplying that oxygen out of that air that comes in to the working muscle, which is gonna be via the heart, not the heart and the blood. An increase in heart rate is gonna represent I'm trying to get more oxygen around the system. I'm trying to pump it a lot faster. And the body's starting to struggle here, so I need to get it going. And that's where we're gonna see our heart rate drift in something like a long, slow run is that the body's really trying to just increase that supply of oxygen to meet our oxygen demand. When you nail your long, slow runs, you should be at a really good steady state. You're running at the same pace, maybe it's five minute K pace, for example, and your heart rate stays at 160 beats per minute, very close to the entire way along. That means our supply is equaling our demand. We don't need to keep increasing it. When we have that discrepancy where our demand's a little, a little bit high and our supply can't quite keep up, our heart rate will keep going up and up and up. And that's what happens in your lab testing or a ramp test style protocol where you start out low and you go higher and higher and higher. What happens there is like we're constantly increasing the demand. So our heart rate is gonna keep going up and up and up. And that's why as you get faster, heart rate starts to rise. So it's a type of thing that if we are impacting that process in some way, if you had perfect running technique, we would have a reasonably linear relationship with our, with our exercise intensity effectively. It's like, as we want to try and run faster, well, we use a proportional amount of oxygen consumption and, and away we go. But if we've got a limiter or almost like a handbrake, if you think about it, in terms of our technique, that there's something there that's missing and something breaking down that's causing us to use more oxygen or have a higher oxygen cost, not as good economy, it's gonna mean that from a physiological perspective, we're gonna be under more stress to create it. And this is where we get into some trouble when it comes to uh, our zone two running. And something I, I experienced, like I mentioned before, is that you start running, you might not be running very fast, five minute K pace, 5.30 for me at the moment in a bit of off season, but my heart rate goes through the roof, 160, 170, 180 beats per minute very, very quickly. And as the, se the session went on, it just drifted further and further upward, potentially, Part of that is a little bit of physiology. For me, I haven't done a lot of long, slow running. So it's it's one being disciplined and staying in that zone. I'm gonna park that for a second. For a lot of amateur athletes who do a lot of volume and they're constantly frustrated, they're constantly a bit, bit sort of burnt out because they're constantly running almost like a tempo or even threshold intensity in these big runs because they just go, screw it. I'll just let my heart rate just go up and up and up and, and I'll just deal with the consequences later. What, what we're seeing there is fundamentally it comes down to a technique aspect and really their economy not being that great. So there's a couple of ways that we can look at improving economy. The first part I wanna talk about is one of the most common things. And I actually picked this up from a, an absolute gun when it comes to running technique, Paul McKinnon. He's also known as the balance runner. I'll leave uh, down in the description a tag to his social media. You can go follow him. He's unbelievable. He's the person I go to uh, and get all my information for running technique. He's the person I send athletes to, uh, but also he's the person who looks after my own running technique. So I've witnessed his stuff firsthand. But he talks about really, there's two common things that he sees. Fundamentally, what we're aiming for is a running mechanic, is what he calls it. And a running mechanic means that within your um, within your gait cycle, and what we mean by gait cycle is just in your movement from a running perspective and, and the motion, the repetitive motion, there's a flight there's a flight phase. And a flight phase means you're not in contact with the ground. At some point, both feet are off the ground and you're up in the air. When we're up in the air, we're not expending at that instantaneous moment in time, we're not expending any force or producing any force into the ground because we're not touching anything. So that's, that's where runners who have that good flight phase and a little bit of float to their running, they look like they're effortless. And, and that's because they've got this really good flight, flight phase and also it's not costing them any, anything to be off the ground. You don't wanna just be jumping up and down though. So there's a balance to that. It's being able to maximize that in the right direction. So not just being completely vertical and really bouncy. You might have a little bit of bounce to you, but it's this nice floating sort of style that you can see them clearly come up off the ground in certain aspects of their, their form or the, or the gait cycle. The second thing that commonly we see is just an extension of what we call a walking mechanic. So there's a very, very small flight time, uh, a very, very small window, or there's sometimes always one foot on the ground, which is fundamentally what we are when we're walking. We never have 
two feet off the ground when we're walking. And if you look at things like race walking at the Olympics just gone and, and the Paralympics, it's the type of thing that you'll see this awkward technique. And why is it awkward? Because they're, they're trying to go as fast as they can, but they're also trying to keep one foot on the ground all the time because they're not allowed to leave the ground. Otherwise, that would be considered a run. And this is where if we have this, this walking mechanic, as intensity goes up, so as we try and implement that to a bit of a run, and you might get a little bit of flight phase, what tends to happen is that it's heavily driven from the lower part of the leg, so knee down effectively. And what this means is that commonly it presents itself as a bit of an overstride. So you tend to reach out in front of you a little bit more, not always the case. And then some funny things can happen. You might be a heel striker, you might be, uh, you might be a midfoot, you might be a, t- a, a sort of more toe, a toe strike on the ground. All of that's a little bit sort of secondary to this. Um, but commonly what it means is if you're overstriding a bit, you're probably putting a bit of braking force on your body. So there's another restriction in terms of something actually, instead of propelling you, it's, it's hindering that propulsion as you take more, more and more strides. And ultimately that's gonna increase your oxygen cost because now you're overcoming more resistance. Um, we, we don't have this, this break if you like. And if you wanna, I guess, compare it, if you think about when you're on the bike, for example, and you're just sort of free spinning and you've got a little bit of hill behind you and you can pause and you, you pedal stroke for a bit and you save a bit of energy in those, those little pedal stroke moments. This is the same thing in a running perspective. If you're on the power the entire time, 100% of the pedal stroke, people find this when they're riding out on the road versus when they're on a kicker, for example, indoors. It's so much harder when you're, on a, when you're on the power the entire time in erg mode than it is when you have those dead spots. You might be still holding average, same average power, but you, you have those little pauses and breaks, which ultimately is coming down to the economy side of things. And that's the same from running. So when we, what we ideally want to get to is more of an upper leg dominant, uh, dominant pattern, which doesn't necessarily stem from what's happening down below. It's not necessarily stemming from a cadence change. It's not necessarily stemming from uh, are you heel striking, you midfoot, whatever. It quite often stems from what's happening up top. And this is something Paul talks about quite a bit is that it, anything uh, up top likely is gonna dictate the movement down the bottom and, and almost vice versa. So it's, it's making sure the whole chain is correct. And to share a little bit of insight in terms of where my running economy has come from or my running technique has come from, without even knowing, I went and saw, saw Paul for the first time, this is a couple of years ago, without even knowing, I was making little circles with my left arm. Did, didn't really know why, and it was, I guess it was just something that always happened. What that was doing, that was causing havoc with what my hips were doing and tilting my hips forwards, backwards, rolling around all, the, all over the place, doing funny little things. As soon as I started to eliminate this arm going in circles, doing crazy things, one, I felt a lot more balanced. So I wasn't being thrown out by this arm's doing one thing, this arm's doing another. But also it completely fixed up what was happening down below and actually freed up a lot of that. I felt like I was just, it was effortless running fast. I feel like I couldn't almost stop myself from running that quick. And I felt like it was almost too much speed. I felt like I was going out too hard. But when in actual fact, I was just opening up the capacity to move in a much more effective and better way in terms of a more more economical uh, way which ultimately is going to lead to better running in the long run. So, so ultimately, we want to try and get to this point where we are using a running a running mechanic. We don't want to be just fast walking. And that's probably, uh, I guess, the reason why I raise that a little bit is quite often we hear um, athletes and amateur athletes in particular talk about, well, when I slow down too much to try and keep that heart rate down, it just feels like I'm walking. Like it's frustrating. I feel like I'm race walking. The reason is, is because you've, you've got a, a set of mechanics or a technique that is representative of what walking is like. You're just trying to do it fast. And it might not be actually helping because, again, it's not as economical. So what's that mean? Oxygen cost is up, heart rate starts to drift and the like. And when you get into a run, you're just exacerbating that movement. You're almost making it worse. So really, there's a couple of things that you need to consider. It, it's all about making sure that your economy is improved. Probably the last couple of things to touch on here, and we've spoken about the physiology. We've talked about a bit of technique, and I'm not going to deep dive into technique because it partially is quite individual. There's, there's different things we have to consider with um, people's proportions in terms of their body size, limb length, whether what their arms can and can't do, res- physical restrictions, etc. So I'm not going to cover that too much. And like I said, I'll leave Paul's details down below so you can go check his stuff out and get in contact with him. He does some awesome online sessions now, uh, particularly with COVID. So you can you can book in a session with him and, and work through that uh, with someone who's a little bit more specialized. But there's there's all this talk, um, particularly in the 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 industry or in, in running, and it's popped up over the last couple of years in terms of well, improving economy is just going and getting in the gym. There's a couple of ways I want to end this video here by talking about this. First thing is that I'm a big advocate for doing some strength work, getting in the gym and, and improving your running that way. And sure, there is some re- there's some strong research to say it does improve running technique. 
by quite significant percentages. I think I was reading an Instagram post someone put up the other day, two to 8%, uh, amazing increases. Yes, it can do that. We get some really good uh, benefit in terms of injury preventative stuff, so we can keep running for long, which is gonna help us in the long run. But ultimately, it's gonna improve things like how well our Achilles and our calf complex works, so we spring off the ground a bit better. That's all very good, as long as we have the assumption that your technique is flawless to begin with. <laughs> because if we've, got, if we've got this walking mechanic where we're not really generating much flight, that to me indicates that we're not really getting that spring off the ground. And if we're not getting the spring off the ground, we can't make the most of this amazing calf and Achilles complex that we've got. So you can get as strong as you like, but if you produce a poor movement, you're just getting really strong in a really bad way. So then again, you're gonna be exacerbating, well, how much force can I produce through a poor movement? Increases your oxygen cost, worsens your economy. We don't really, we don't really get anywhere. So strength and conditioning and the, the gym side of stuff is really, really fantastic and I'm absolute, absolute advocate for it. But at the end of the day, movement changes movement. And that's the big thing that Paul likes to talk about. Something that's always stuck with me since chatting to him and getting in touch with him is that movement is gonna change it. We need to go in and, and fundamentally change the way your body actually co is coordinating itself to create the output. That is what's gonna unlock all of this benefit from a running specific perspective. Then we can go and train how strong you are in those movements and, and how powerful and how explosive you are, etc., and how long you can do that for which is ultimately the training on the back end, the strength and conditioning, the gym work, going out and doing your long, slow running and being able to keep that heart rate down. So that's something I wanna leave you on and, and just sort of um, keep in mind when it does come to this stuff. It's not just it's not just going out and doing, get, getting stronger. Right? It's not, it's not uh, going out and just forcing yourself to keep your heart rate down. It can be a combination of these factors. D being disciplined, keeping your heart rate down, making sure you've got accurate training zones, of course, are really important. Going and getting stronger so you're less um, likely to get injured and things like that keeps you out there running for longer. So it's going to help improve your, your running economy. Going and doing high intensity interval training has been shown to be really effective for improving your running economy. Running at high speed, really, really good. But changing your movement to maximize the technique side of things so you get a bit of flight, you, you're not wasting any of that oxygen consumption. You can reduce that oxygen cost is going to help keep that heart rate down and help, help allow you to run into that zone two maximize that time in the zone two and make the most of your training in the long run. So hopefully you got a bit out of this video, a little bit of a longer one, a lot to cover in there. If you've got any questions, please leave them down below. And I might actually take some of those questions and pass them on to Paul and get some of his thoughts. Maybe we'll have to get him on a live stream or, an, or a video to chat directly to you guys. I think it'd be really useful. And like I said, when lockdown and things like that in Melbourne here end, I'm gonna be going and see him. So maybe I'll do a couple of couple of sessions with him, take you inside and film them as well, give you a bit of an insight into how he works. But I'll definitely leave his details down below. So go check him out, go give him a follow. Absolute awesome guy, apart from an absolute gun when it comes to running technique, he's just a great dude too. Hopefully you got a lot out of this video. I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next one.